What I'd like to start out with is pretty much first go through an examination with some of its pathologies then tie together in uh, the clinical entities and then from uh, there uh, move on quickly to the uh, diagnosis and then uh, as I said to the preoperative assessment of the cardiac patient. Here on the left you see a normal jugular venous pulse and I hope that you're all kind of familiar with this. On the right side I've kind of summed up one more time what this is about. First of all you have the A wave which is then followed by the C wave which is the bulging of the tricuspid ring and the leaflets upon closure. Then you have the X descent which is the relaxation of the atrium and the volume of blood during the ventricular contraction which makes the tricuspid ring move upwards a little bit. Then subsequently the Y descent with blood that goes away into the right ventricle and the whole cycle starts over again. This actually pretty simple uh, uh, feature can be used as you can see in the next uh, two slides to explain pretty much all the pathology that you might be faced with in this examination. First of all, let's go with the giant A wave and the impaired Y descent. Uh, what you would end up with is when you have the um, elimination of the X descent, you would end up with tricuspid insufficiency and a hyperkinetic syndrome. If you have a giant A wave, uh, with a blunted Y descent, you would end up with a tri you have in inflow impediment, which would lead to tricuspid stenosis, and all sorts that are associated, all conditions that are associated with elevated right-sided pressures, which is, of course, pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary stenosis, and of course the end stages of uh, COPD. Anything else that might impede inflow, like atrial clots and tumors, but these are very rare and most likely will not play a role in your examination. Now, with the rapid Y descent that I depicted here, you always have to think first about constrictive pericarditis and or uh, restrictive filling, most likely due to right ventricular infarction. Now, a huge peaked V wave, of course, can be the tricuspid regurgitation, but also think about a volume overloaded right side with an ASD. And the absence of the C wave is clearly the dropped ventricular contraction. You guys may not know this, but the first descriptions of first and second degree AV block was not made with the electrocardiogram. It was made by uh, Mobitz uh, just by looking at the patient's jugular venous pulse, so pretty darn good. Venous hums may pop up uh, as a question uh, regarding uh, in patients with uh, hemodialysis. They are always or usually associated with high flow states. They are present in the younger adults especially and they are normal there and they are particularly prominent and, and uh, with high incidence in uh, children. If they have a normal aged patient for you, always think dialysis because in dialysis, because of high flow states, are during hemodialysis, you'll find it in the majority of patients and even between treatments, about a third of the patients will have a venous hum, not on the side of their shunt, but for example, by a jugular venous examination. Now, this should be abolished by either by the Valsalva maneuver or by distal venous compression. Now, I summarized the buzzwords for you here for the arterial pulse. First of all, when they mention parvus and tardis, think about aortic stenosis. Parvus, non-tardis, think about the low output state associated with cardiomyopathies or a heart failure. Diacrotic is the low output with increased peripheral resistance. Bounding, always think about a high flow state with aortic regurgitation or an AV fistula. The bifid usually is associated with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy in their language. And bisference is the aortic stenosis or the aortic regurgitation due to hyperactivity of the ventricle. Now these are the apical impulses. Uh, as they're showing up. The normal one, the hyperkinetic, which has the same duration but is much more easily felt, and of course and then the protracted one, uh, which is sustained like for example uh, in uh, LVH and aortic stenosis. 
First of all, if the apex is displaced, as described as the impulse is poor and diffuse, think cardiomyopathy. Sustained is left ventricular hypertrophy or aortic stenosis. If it's multifit or trifit, think about hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. If it's hyperdynamic and more diffuse, it is due to mitral regurgitation. And if it's tapping, localized, and somewhat uh, less prominent, think mitral stenosis. Now let's walk through the cardiac cycle together. Let's start with the first heart sound. The mitral valve closure is the first component, which is then followed by the tricuspid valve closure. The louder it is, you have mitral stenosis or if you shorten the PR interval. Now there is one exception. If the mitral stenosis is extremely calcified, in other words, the leaflets are no longer mobile, the first heart sound starts to diminish. It is decreased with mitral valvular calcification in the older when the P, or the atrial contraction, moves out from the R interval and in aortic regurgitation. Now, the ejection clicks. Don't confuse them with a split S1. The etiology initially is that of a normal patient, is normal in younger patients, but always think about the uh, outflow valves, the abnormal aortic, or the pulmonary valves, either as a bicuspid valve or with other congenital abnormalities. You hear ejection clacks in pulsatile distension and increased flow states, which is usually in the younger patients, and of course an increased pressure in the great vessel in systemic hypertension. Now the second heart sound, again, is, consist, uh, is composed of the aortic valve closure followed by the pulmonary valve closure. It is increased in hypertension. However, it becomes decreased pretty much in the heavily calcified mitral valve when the aortic valve calcifies. The fixed split is always associated with an ASD or a pulmonary stenosis. However, there they will probably describe it as markedly accentuated. Paradoxical splits occur when you either have a left bundle branch block with delayed activation of the left ventricle or when the excitation wave takes longer and left ventricular hypertrophy or aortic stenosis with subsequent left ventricular hypertrophy. The opening snap is essentially increased flow in the initial phases after the mitral valve opening is most common in mitral stenosis. Again, be mindful that in order to hear an, in, an opening snap, the mitral valve leaflets have to be mobile. A narrow gap between the second heart sound and the opening snap is associated with severe mitral stenosis. Why? Because the increase in the left atrial pressure. It is best heard over the left sternal border and it's transmitted from the apex. It's also usually the place where you best hear the mitral valve inflow murmur, the rumble. The third heart sound is related to the core tensing and stiffness of the ventricle. It is normal in patients who are under the age of 30 because of their hyperdynamic uh, ventricle in diastole, which is their phenomenal elastins. However, in older patients, it is usually associated with significant dysfunction of the left ventricle due to volume overload. And the most common culprits are aortic regurgitation or mitral regurgitation or cardiomyopathy. Now, last but not least, the fourth heart sound. The fourth heart sound is the expression of the atrial kick into a stiff, non-compliant ventricle. It is usually present in a ventricle that is not systolically challenged, but diastolically challenged. So the fourth heart sound is truly a, a measure of diastolic dysfunction. And it's present in aortic stenosis, it's present in systemic hypertension, long-standing, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or in ischemia. 
Just for you to memorize the valve closure mnemonic, the mitral valve, tricuspid, followed by aortic and pneumonic, so a pulmonic, many things are possible. Murmurs. General, just let's think about these first in general. Don't get afraid of murmurs in the examination. There's a couple of things, general terms, that you do need to re uh, just have in mind and have the presence of mind to remember when they come up. First about the murmur and obstruction of semilunar valves. Very simple. The longer they are, the more severe the murmur is. The later the peak, the more severe the murmur because it takes longer to overcome the resistance. And it is separate from the first heart sound. That's always a big feature. The regurgitation of the atrioventricular valves is, the longer they are, the more compliant the atrium still is. In other words, the pressure in the atrium has not risen because otherwise you will not hear a hollow systolic murmur. And it is usually decrescendo especially when the pressure equilibration is fairly early. Otherwise, you can hear a hollow systolic blowing murmur into the, at the apex into the left atrium. And it is always engulfing the first heart sound regardless whether it is uh, including the tricuspid or the mitral valve that is regurgitated. This is one of the things you do have to learn. This is so important because there, I'll bet you there will be a question coming. First of all, the maneuvers that alter cardiac murmurs. And I tried for you to break them down somewhat simple. Inspiration increases the venous return. The Valsalva maneuver does the opposite. It decreases the venous return. The hand grip increases the cardiac output and it increases the systemic arterial pressure. Now, postural changes, getting the patient from lying down to standing up, is somewhat in the initial phase like the venous return reduction, like the Valsalva maneuver. Temporarily, you reduce the stroke volume. Subsequently, you increase the heart rate. And subsequently, you have a peripheral increase in peripheral resistance. So the postural change overall is the much more complicated maneuver because it's multiphasic. Squatting increases the peripheral resistance and the venous return, and it's somewhat the opposite to the Valsalva maneuver. And amyl nitrate, which is often used in echocardiography and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, is used to drastically reduce the peripheral resistance, which then leads to a reflex tachycardia with subsequent increase in the heart rate. Now let's jump right in and look at how it affects the most common differential diagnosis you will encounter. First, let's look at the mitral valve. Amyl nitrate, I told you, reduces the afterload. Afterload will increase the forward stroke volume, which will reduce the mitral regurgitation. Now, the mitral valve prolapse, which they will most likely ask you to differentiate, is not going to be affected by it, or as a matter of fact, it will increase. Why will it do that? Because with forward stroke volume, you will have less of tensing of the mitral valve and there is less prolapsing of the tips of the leaflet into the left atrium. If you reduce the preload, again, you will have less volume to shunt back. However, if you reduce the preload, you will also reduce the size of the ventricle. Since the mitral valve prolapse can also be characterized by the leaflets being too large for the size of the ventricle, this will have the opposite effect on the mitral valve prolapse. It will actually increase the murmur of mitral valve prolapse. Hand grip with increased afterload and subsequently uh, stroke volume will lead to an increase in mitral regurgitation, which will have the opposite effect on the mitral valve prolapse. Post-PVC leads to increased contractility and reduced afterload because of prolonged runoff. That will have essentially no effect because these two cancel each other out for mitral regurgitation, 
but this will lead to an increase in the left ventricular size which will diminish the murmur of mitral valve prolapse. Now on the right, let's go through aortic stenosis versus hokum because those are the two that they may contrast. Here amyl nitrate with reduction in the afterload will lead to both increase in murmur in hokum and in aortic stenosis. In contrast, the Valsalva maneuver, which leads to a reduced preload, will lead to a reduction in the aortic stenosis murmur because you have less filling and less volume to overcome. However, the intraventricular um, gradient, which is due to the markedly enhanced muscle mass, will be much more marked on physical examination with hokum. Thus, that is the maneuver to distinguish between the two entities. Hand grip, again, afterload increasing will lead to a reduction in aortic stenosis because the peripheral resistance will go up and will lead to a reduced murmur, so there's no way to differentiate anything. Now, in post-PVC, you will have an increase in the murmur of aortic stenosis because the markedly larger left ventricle is now finding a fixed stenosis. However, since this is a dynamic stenosis due to the increased muscle mass, an increase in ventricular volume will lead to a reduced murmur on Holcomb. That, by the way, I think is still a mistake in the book, but we'll correct it in the next uh, edition. Let's now go to the clinical entities and some of the things that they will bring, you, uh, bring for you uh, in, the, in the question section. First of all, the aortic stenosis, the supravalvular aortic stenosis, has a prominent left ventricular apical bead. There's a thrill in the suprasternal notch, and interestingly, because it is supraventricular and the angulation is, favors the uh, radiation into the right, the thrill is usually felt over the right rather than left. There is a systolic murmur without a click because it's usually a, mem it's a membranous defect above the aortic valve. And the most important feature is that the A2 is preserved independent of the stenosis severity because the aortic valve is usually not affected. In subvalvular stenosis, which can be a membranous, a muscular, or a combined defect, you still have a prominent left ventricle on x-ray. There is no click or thrill because the uh, da downstream, the aortic valve that sits downstream will prevent that. Reduced pulse pressure is present and there is a systolic and often due to the distortion a diastolic murmur. Aortic stenosis, just the most common features. You have a parvus and tardis. Remember, if you have that, you need moderate aortic stenosis. Mild aortic stenosis, the murmur will neither radiate nor will it affect the peripheral pulses. The left ventricular impulse is lateralized, it's localized, and it's sustained. It's usually not descendant because it's pressure, not volume overload. You may feel arterial thrills. The fourth heart sound is usually present. And the longer the murmur and the later the peaking, the more severe the stenosis. Additional features include LVH. Please be mindful that in young patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis, this feature may actually be absent for the longest time. With left ventricular hypertrophy, you often get left bundle branch block. Then subsequently, because of the calcification and the proximity to the AV node, AV conduction delay, the chest x-ray is insensitive, so don't look for it. And post dilatation of the aortic root is common, particularly in long-standing severe stenosis. Physical examination on bicuspid aortic valve, particularly in the, uh, when pliability is still preserved, you'll find an ejection click. The earlier the ejection click, the more severe the stenosis. Usually the A2 is present, but it becomes diminished and delayed the more the bicuspid aortic valve calcifies, and unfortunately, they do more rapidly and more aggressively. 
than the uh, degenerative rheumatic valve. No ejection click and the A2 becomes diminished and absent when uh, in later stages with advanced stenosis. Now here's a little helper. If they present a patient that is young with features of aortic stenosis, think congenital, think bicuspid. And whenever you do, think about coarctation because about 10 to 15 percent of the patients have accompanying coarctation. In older patients above 55, think degenerative. And think rheumatic valve disease with accompanying CAD. Symptoms, as you know, are angina, syncope, and congestive heart failure. Now, ask for therapy. There is really no effective medical therapy, period. Don't look for one. Don't, if they give you an answer, ignore it. If the patient is truly asymptomatic, you may follow him conser uh, conservatively with what they call watchful waiting. Now again, as you can see, here are the three features, and here is the problem with aortic stenosis. When aortic stenosis becomes symptomatic, it happens in the later stages, and any symptoms, be it angina, be it syncope, or be it sudden cardiac uh, death, or, uh, is always with an unfavorable prognosis, no matter which one of these three you choose. If they offer balloon valvuloplasty, don't pick it. It's only palliative. It's got terrible results. The definite therapy is either aortic valve replacement and repair, and age is usually not a contraindication. And in these patients, if you choose to follow them, you need endocarditis prophylaxis. Aortic regurgitation, essentially two uh, big causes, the valvular and the aortic root, as well as the hypertension. The leading one is actually now rheumatic fever, no longer infective endocarditis. And when it comes from the aortic root, it is dilatation of the aortic ring due to hypertension and aging, where hypertension is the most leading one. Marfan syndrome, aortic dissection, and the immune the collagen vascular diseases, as well as syphilis, are very, very rare. On physical examination, I indicated it before, soft first heart sound, bounding pulse, the ventricular impulse is diffuse and hyperdynamic and usually descendant. The duration of the murmur, not the loudness, gives you, correlates with hemodynamic significance. The shorter the murmur, the more decrescendo. The faster the pressure equilibration, the more severe the murmur. Acute diastolic dysfunction, uh, a, a, acute aortic regurgitation is usually associated only with a, sm with a very brief systolic murmur because you have essentially immediate pressure equilibration. Findings in acute versus chronic aortic regurgitation. The stroke volume in acute regurgitation is small, it's large and chronic because the ventricle had time to compensate. Ventricular size is normal in acute. There was no chance for the ventricle to remodel. It's dilated and chronic. As a matter of fact, aortic regurgitation followed by mitral regurgitation are the two most effective precipitators for ventricular dilatation. The first heart sound is essentially absent in acute uh, aortic regurgitation and it's diminished in chronic. And the diastolic murmur, especially in severe acute aortic regurgitation, is absent. And the pulse amplitude is increased with a large, with a high systolic and a low diastolic blood pressure. And it is usually normal with overall reduced systolic blood pressure. Workup and therapy for aortic regurgitation, as in all valvular diseases, think echocardiography. Medical therapy, especially in chronic, may be temporarily effective with ACE inhibition. However, think about the 55 rule. If the symptoms occur, that is left-sided failure sets in, if the left ventricular ejection fraction is below 55% and the end systolic dimension, in other words, the ventricular dimension has increased above 55 millimeters, they will probably still use that. There is actually now evidence that it is advantageous to operate at an earlier stage. 
because aortic regurgitation, once you make the valve competent, usually gives you post-operative, at least temporary, if not permanent, marked reduction in left ventricular function, similar to mitral regurgitation operated on too late. The therapeutic surgical options are now more prominent. Repair is starting to pull even with replacement. And this procedure, which is a swap of the pulmonary valve into the aortic position, should only be considered as a temporary, as a procedure in patients with overall reduced prognosis. Patients who lack the pulmonary valve go into right-sided failure within 10 years. Mitral stenosis. The ECG is really not very helpful. It gives you a P-mitral if sinus rhythm is present. However, more than 40% of the patients are in atrial fibrillation within three years. And right ventricular hypertrophy by the Estes criteria. However, what they will most likely present is a chest x-ray like this with straightening of the left-sided border. So in other words, obliteration of the, uh, of the AP window, the large left atrial uh, shadow, the dilated upper lobes, the pulmonary infiltrates, the curly B lines, which indicate that the left ventricular and that the left atrial pressure is exceeding 20 millimeters of mercury, and the widening of the tracheal uh, bifurcation due to the pushing up of the ventricle. Symptoms are typical of left sided failure, they are non specific dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. These symptoms are of hemoptysis, hoarseness due to compression of the recurrence nerve, or symptoms of right-sided failure are more specific. However, if they occur, you usually have missed the boat. Physical examination, the loud first heart sound in a still somewhat pliable valve, the opening snap, the diastolic rumble with the loud P2 and the RV lift, due to right-sided uh, uh, increase in pulmonary pressures with subsequent elevated JVP and ultimately with ascites and edema. If they present these signs, you're dealing with ominous mitral stenosis and you should be concerned that the pulmonary hypertension you're dealing with is essentially fixed and thus these patients are too late for consideration of surgery. Again, as in all valve diseases, echocardiography is the leading uh, modality, diagnostic modality of choice, which gives you the severity of the valve disease, left atrial size, which is important to consider if the patient should be cardioverted into sinus rhythm, right ventricular function and pressure, and the assessment if the patient is a candidate for valvuloplasty, probably they will not ask you that. The therapy is, in, is intent on prolongation of the diastolic interval. In other words, you want to give the patient a chance to pressure equilibrate. That is, you are trying to aim rate control at all cost. And beta blockers and calcium channel antagonists from the verapamil type are actually the drugs of choice there. Diuretics, especially with mild right-hearted failure, however, be careful because if you reduce the intravascular volume too much, you will actually have a, a failure of the left atrium and consider early anticoagulation. Intervention surgical approach I talked before is the balloon valvuloplasty. In, still in the underdeveloped countries, commissurotomy is practiced with excellent results or nowadays we are trying valve reconstruction. However, that is only possible if the valve is not heavily calcified and you have enough material to work with. Just as a table I put together for you, a little bit on degrees of severity. First of all, mild stenosis goes along with a valve area of, of 1.5 to 2 centimeters. And you will notice that the mean gradient has got to be under 6. And in this case, the pressure is usually normal, the right side of pressures. These are the areas you need to concern about, and we should always pick up the mitral stenosis in this level. When you have a nice diastolic rumble, when the mean gradient is 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury, which is quite nicely audible, and the pressures are the most moderately elevated. At these pressures, 
at this level of uh, severity, you will very often find that the patient has long-standing undiagnosed mitral stenosis and that you will find the right ventricular pressures very often get close to systemic pressures and you're too late. Now, the most common cause that they will offer, which is actually making a run back up in popularity, so we have lost that battle so far, is the rheumatic fever. It's on the rise again. Second is the myxematous degeneration, and thirdly, the infective endocarditis. Then comes the papillary muscle dysfunction. Think about it. If they give you a patient who has previous myocardial infarction is doing quite well and all of a sudden about six days later you are called to the patient's bed and there is the patient with acute pulmonary edema and a murmur and in failure and you, they give you a, di a systolic murmur. Think about ischemic papillary muscle dysfunction. Physical examination in mitral regurgitation the acute mitral regurgitation we just talked about yields a hyperactive apical impulse with usually a systolic apical thrill that you can feel and a harsh systolic murmur. If it is hollow systolic, you're actually in fairly decent shape because you still have a pressure gradient across the left atrium. If it is decrescendo and it is non hollow systolic, you're in dire straits. The third and fourth heart sound are usually heard. And this I put in parentheses because somebody mentioned to me that they have brought a spindle-shaped murmur. However, I don't think that that pertains to mitral regurgitation. Physical examination on chronic is much more benign. You have the left ventricular and the left atrial enlargement. The apical impulse is usually lateralized. It is enlarged. It's displaced. You have a blowing hollow systolic murmur if the atrial compliance is not overwhelmed. You have a widely split second heart sound. And in the later stages, you'll find, because of the large shuttle volume, a third heart sound. And you hear the diastolic rumble due to the relative stenosis if you have a very large mitral regurg very severe mitral regurgitation. If you encounter this in the questions, always think severe MR. Severe chronic MR should be considered for surgery. Now, history in acute is always sudden onset. It's always accompanied by dyspnea, orthopnea, and pulmonary edema. It's usually these reasons. A previously healthy, which severe dyspnea, think about a ruptured cord at tendini due to mitral valve prolapse. If you have infective endocarditis, usually they give you fever and chills. Think about a perforated leaflet. That's a surgical call. Chest injury. Think post-traumatic mitral regurgitation to the rupture of the anterior leaflet, usually. Coronary artery disease. Think papillary muscle dysfunction and myocardial infarction, especially in a patient who had an uncomplicated cause late in the course of recovery is papillary muscle rupture. Again, now on the increase, because we are doing so well in having patients survive their initial onslaught, maybe endocarditis or myocardial infarction, we're dealing with heart failure. Heart failure leading to dilatation of the mitral annulus, leading to chronic mitral regurgitation. Second most common cause is still rheumatic fever, followed by mitral valve prolapse. If they want you to alert you to that, they usually also bring other nonspecific symptoms in it like anxiety, fatigue, chest discomfort, atypical particularly, and palpitations. Treatment of acute mitral regurgitation. I listed these here, however, be aware that these are just if you're really fast. You should, this should be the very first thing that somebody else who's helping you out is doing, is calling the surgeon. That is the definite therapy. In the meantime, you can try DIG, you can try diuretics, oxygen, and any sort of afterload reduction that you can think of, particularly like doing an intra-aortic balloon pump. But these, especially in severe acute MR, should only be temporizing. You can try because you may not be able to discern at the point, especially in the ER, whether this is due to infection, 
think endocarditis prophylaxis just started. It, it cannot hurt at this particular point. If you have chronic MR, you can treat for a while medically. We have, are starting to, digitalis is falling out of favor, but particularly ACE inhibition and diuretics, trying to reduce the peripheral resistance is helpful to increase the forward flow. If you encounter only the slightest chance of dysrhythmias, think anticoagulation, and you need antibiotic coverage. Surgery, valve repair, particularly if you have redundant tissue, is actually becoming the dominant form of therapy. Briefly about the imaging modality. I have this as a handout, and they're making copies right now, so let's not bother going in too much detail. One of the most prominent imaging modalities because of its availability is the echo, which is very good in determining the ejection fraction, size, mass of the ventricle. It is the, the uh, imaging modality of choice to assess valves, and it has replaced angiography for the diagnosis of shunts. In terms of EF, a, radio, a resting radionuclide angiogram, a multiple gated angiogram, is actually the most accurate and the cheapest. The remaining size, left ventricular size, it's good in serial, not so much in comparative studies. It cannot assess left ventricular muscle mass. SPECT, particularly with the new gated ones, are very good in assessing the ejection fraction. Uh, valvular disease shunts cannot be assessed. The newer technologies, and I don't think they will ask you about this with cardiology, not in the terms of LV function, Electron beam computed tomography is excellent. It's actually the reference method for ejection fraction, size, and LVH. However, it is costly, and the availability, just like an MRI, is low. Preoperative assessment, I have gotten a lot of questions in the past, and so I'm trying to simplify this for you. Don't get confused. Think about the three things you need to consider. You need to consider the patient status, Contrast that with the risk of surgery. Contrast that with the indication for surgery. Are you dealing with an emergency surgery? Are you dealing with an urgent or an elective surgery? The more elective, the more consider the patient status and the risk of the surgery. If it is urgent like cancer surgery and or acute illness, you cannot delay the surgery. So in other words, you may be willing to take a somewhat higher risk, both in regards to patient status and in risk of surgery. Usually it is the best to work the cascade upwards. Think about the indication, then think about the risk for surgery. If this risk is lower than the patient, uh, than the patient try, uh, fixing the cardiac status, always go for the surgery. Again, I've put this together in the handout. Preoperative assessment, the high-risk surgeries are with a f higher than 5% mortality in a patient with established cardiac pathology. Is the emergency surgery, aortic major vessel surgery, peripheral vascular, so anything to do with the vessels, and prolonged surgery with fluid shifts or blood loss, particularly neurosurgical procedures, laminectomies. Now, intermediate risk, less than 5%, is carotid and arterectomy, head and neck, I don't know why, it doesn't seem the brain is important, interperitoneal or thoracic surgery, orthopedic and prostate. This is the group where you need to consider most carefully whether you want to do a cardiac workup. In this group, endoscopic, superficial, cataract surgery, breast surgery, usually don't even consider because the risk of surgery is so low that whatever you do in the meantime as a cardiac intervention bears a higher risk. Now, the clinical predictors for major risk are, of course, unstable coronary syndromes, decompensated stage four heart failure, significant arrhythmias that are hemodynamically effective. In other words, they can be both supraventricular or ventricular dysrhythmias, but they have to be hemodynamically effective, and severe valvular disease, which is usually presented as decompensated heart failure. 
intermediate risks from a clinical perspective in a patient is a patient with mild reproducible angina, a prior MI, a compensated or a previous history of congestive heart failure, and diabetes mellitus of unknown duration and unknown uh, treatment uh, quality. Minor, our advanced age, age is not a contraindication, is an abnormal ECG with nonspecific changes, with rhythm any other than sinus, that is benign dysrhythmias or just an atrial rhythm, a low functional capacity, and here the buzzword is the four mats. In other words, can you carry up a grocery bag up a flight of stairs? If you can, this patient is in a minor category. A history of stroke and uncontrolled systolic hypertension at the presentation of the consideration for surgery. When they ask you about indication for coronary angiography, there are very few cases which have a class one. In other words, it's acknowledged as being beneficial, which is the high risk result with non-invasive testing. In other words, you have an early positive test in the past on this patient and no third intervention had been done in the meantime. Angina pectoris, which is known to be coronary disease, which is not responsive at the time of patient uh, visit uh, to medical therapy, and if you have frank, unstable angina, and if you have an equivocal or a non-diagnostic stress test in a patient that you consider high risk from the surgical point of view. In other words, you're considering major vascular surgery. Here, it is rather equivocal. This is a class two indication. In other words, there is diverging evidence for both sides, which is the intermediate risk result with non-invasive testing. Again, if they give you a patient who has a long duration and exercises well, even if he has ST segment depression, he should be considered for surgery. If you have an equivocal or a non-diagnostic test in a low-risk patient, who is undergoing a high-risk non-cardiac surgery, like, for example, I mentioned before, uh, aortic uh, surgery, uh, uh, fixing of a AAA, for example. If you have urgent non-cardiac surgery within seven days of myocardial infarction, or, similar point, you are, had a perioperative MI. In this patient, however, be aware, look carefully if they're throwing in pitfalls that the patient cannot be anticoagulated. If you find that the patient had recent neurological surgery, don't make no difference. Don't do an angiogram because you're only doing an angiogram in order to have a catheter-based intervention. You want to find something that you can fix. This patient, however, when they are undergoing calf-based intervention, need anticoagulation. Otherwise, we don't do cardiac intervention. So that can be a pitfall that they may set up. Question number one. Which of the following heart sounds are most compatible with diastolic dysfunction in the adult patient? Number one, S1. Number two, S2. Number three, S3. Number four, S4. Number five, opening snap. Correct answer is number four, S4. Question number two, a 62-year-old patient is scheduled for elective endoscopic cholecystectomy. He had received four-vessel coronary artery bypass grafting 10 years ago. He still has hyperlipidemia and a family history of coronary artery disease. He exercises five times a day, jogging for a total of 18 miles per week without any symptoms. In preparation, he's exercising five times a week. What did I say? A day, and it, I think you are correct. They had a, it's a typo. It's a typo. I apologize. Have he exercises, exercises a great deal. Five times a day. Jeez. It's my turn now. Okay. He exercises a great deal without any symptoms. Okay. Better. In preparation for surgery, you number one obtain a treadmill exercise test. Number two, obtain an exercise MUGA. Number three, obtain an exercise echocardiogram. Number four, obtain a myocardial perfusion scan. Number five, send him directly to surgery. Correct answer is number five, send him to surgery. Question number three, a 43-year-old morbidly obese male 
176 centimeters, 145 kilograms, is presumed to have left ventricular dysfunction. He is a smoker with moderate COPD. What's the best test to assess his left ventricular function? Number one, a MUGA, multiple gated acquisition. Number two, a cath-based left ventricular gram. Number three, an echocardiogram. Number four, a first pass isotope study. Correct answer is number one, a MUGA. You say anything? Okay. Um, the I know you're all here for the internal medicine residency, but I hope some of you consider cardiology. And when that 145-year-old rolls in for the echocardiogram, I hope you're the guys holding the transducer. Because there will be no images in the vast majority of cases. So I try to, you guys picked up the right answer, and it's really good. Uh, this is one COPD with obfuscation of ultrasound for the lungs, this weight, in a short, vertically challenged gentleman, you don't get, just don't consider echocardiogram. Unless it's a valvular question, then you have to bite the bullet or have to go for cath. But, you know, it's not going to work. Question number four. You are following a 43-year-old female patient with rheumatic mitral valve stenosis. On this year's examination, you notice the absence of an opening snap. You conclude, number one, your hearing has degenerated. Number two, the mitral stenosis has improved. Number three, the mitral leaflets are now completely calcified and immobile. Number four, a different heart rate is responsible for this finding. The correct answer is number three, the mitral valve leaflets are completely calcified. Question number five, a 21-year-old medical student comes to you for assessment of a third heart sound. This was accidentally discovered during his physical examination. His mother recalled that he supposedly had a murmur as a baby, but his subsequent records do not show this. He denies any physical limitations. His hobbies include long-distance running. On exam, he has an irregular pulse with a heart rate of 51 beats per minute. His PMI is normal, an RV lift is not present, S1 is unremarkable, S2 is split with respiratory variation. Blood pressure is 104 over 60. Indeed, a soft S3 is present, best heard at the apex. You choose to, number one, perform an echocardiogram, number two, perform a radionuclide angiogram, number three, perform an electrocardiogram, number four, reassure the patient, number five, perform a chest x-ray. Correct answer is number four, reassure the patient. Question number six, a 23-year-old athlete comes to your practice for a physical exam prior to competitive long-distance running. His family physician detected a systolic murmur and asks for clarification by you. On your exam, the patient has a significant pectus excavatum. You hear a 2 over 6 systolic murmur, most noticeable over the left ventricular outflow tract at the third intercostal space peristernally. The murmur does not radiate into the carotids. With Valsalva maneuver, the murmur decreases, but it increases after 10 sit-ups. The jugular venous pulse is normal, and the peripheral pulses are full. What would be a reasonable next exam to assure this young man? Number one, an electrocardiogram. Number two, a chest x-ray. Number three, an echocardiogram. Number four, a radionuclide angiogram or MUGA. Number five, coronary angiogram. Correct answer is number three, an echocardiogram. Question number seven, a 39-year-old female presents to your practice with increasing weight, increasing abdominal girth, and a lower extremity edema. Ten years ago, she underwent mantle field radiation and chemotherapy for Hodgkin's disease. Physical examination shows a heart rate of 92 beats per minute and a blood pressure of 100 over 60. The jugular veins are distended and not compressible at 45 degrees. The breath sounds are absent at the right lower base with dullness to percussion and absent fremitus. PMI is not palpable. A mid-diastolic discrete sound without radiation is noted in the fifth intercostal space. No other murmurs are audible. Pitting edema, three plus up to the thighs, is noted. The most likely diagnosis is number one, radiation-induced coronary artery disease, number two, constrictive pericarditis, number three, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, number four, pericardial effusion, number five, restrictive cardiomyopathy. 
Correct answer is number two, constrictive pericarditis. Question number eight. A 60-year-old man is referred to you for preoperative clearance. He is scheduled to undergo resection of a six-centimeter abdominal aortic aneurysm. He has been an insulin-dependent diabetic since age 40 and is markedly hyperlipidemic. He denies angina but leads a sedentary life. On physical exam, his vital signs are 178 centimeters, 115 kilograms, pulse 86, blood pressure 146 over 94. The cardiac exam is normal, with a normal jugular venous pulse, no cardiac murmurs, and peripheral pulses are full. His laboratory evaluation is remarkable for an elevated plasma glucose of 192 with a glycosylated hemoglobin of 14% and a creatinine of 1.4. The ECG shows nonspecific STT changes. You decide to number one, cancel the surgery, number two, clear him for surgery, number three, initiate anti-anginal therapy and proceed with surgery, number four, arrange a coronary angiogram, number five, arrange a pharmacological stress test. Correct answer is number five, perform a pharmacological stress test. All right. This is the classical patient that was placed right in the middle of the decision tree. In other words, he's got risk factors. He's got uncontrolled diabetes. He's undergoing a high-risk surgery. So you've got to find out whether he has ischemia because he doesn't have any signs of failure. The physical examination is actually quite benign. You have a normal left ventricular function on physical examination. So going to a coronary angiogram will most likely document what you already know. You would not be surprised that this gentleman have some form of ischemia. However, the trick in him is uh, have some form of coronary artery disease. Does he have ischemia? And that's why in this patient, a stress test of some form would be bene is beneficial. Now, if you have an aortic abdominal aneurysm, even this would be a slender patient. You'd rather not have him waltz on a treadmill with a very high pressure. Here, a pharmacological stress test, particularly one that reduces the peripheral resistance like adenosine, is actually beneficial. Question number nine. A 39-year-old airline pilot comes into your practice with concerns of coronary artery disease. He complains about left-sided, sharp, constant chest pain lasting for up to 15 minutes. He does not report any symptoms during his daily exercise. He has brought his symptoms to the attention of his supervisor who notified the Federal Aviation Administration. They insist that he be checked out to maintain his license. In order to maintain his license, you order, number one, positron emission computed tomography, number two, an exercise echocardiogram, number three, an exercise thallium single photon emission computed tomography, number four, ultra-fast electron beam computed tomography, number five, a coronary angiogram. Correct answer is number five, a coronary angiogram. I actually, this, this question proves that bureaucracy has nothing to do with medicine. Because, indeed, you guys are right, from a medical point of view, this patient does not have coronary artery disease. But he made a mistake. He talked to his superiors and to the bureaucracy. The FAA requires, no matter what you do, a coronary angiogram. And if this is positive, even in the slightest way, he needs to reapply after a year. Doesn't make any sense, but that's the way it is. And I apologize, I just kind of couldn't resist because I came across this as one of the questions that was asked, and it's, it's bureaucracy. Question number 10. 45-year-old patient presents to you with the question of endocarditis. He has had classical symptoms for four days of shaking chills, mostly at night, and feeling ill and fatigued. You discover splinter hemorrhages under the nail bed and petechiae in the left conjunctival sac. On cardiac auscultation, you notice a soft 1 over 6 holodiastolic murmur. Subsequent blood cultures reveal Staphylococcus aureus, which is susceptible to ampicillin sodium sobactam sodium combination therapy. You admit the patient to the hospital. Approximately six hours later, you are called because of acute deterioration in the patient's status. 
Upon arrival at the bedside, you notice that the patient has a markedly increased respiratory rate of 32, blood pressure 120 over 80. The heart rate is now markedly tachycardic at 120 beats per minute, and the pulse oximetry shows a reduced oxygen saturation of 88%. The S1 and S2